it's always a pleasure to talk to <laughs> you, Kate. And uh, this is quite a special occasion, isn't it? Because you're back with a symphony orchestra. It has been done once before with the West Australian Symphony Orchestra and this time uh, with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, slightly different in as much as the... Um... This album's taken four years to make, whereas the other was seemingly uh, seemingly impossibly so fast. I think I think we recorded it over two concerts, one of which was of a rehearsal of the concert that we were going to do the next day, and then boom, we had DVD album. But this was recorded within the few weeks or the two weeks before COVID hit Victoria. Mm-hmm. So the MSO were in the can, and that was a given. And then it took me an extra three and a half years to get to the point where we could actually foresee recording, touring and presenting and releasing this album. Mm. Well, it's also a landmark because it is your 30th album as well. Yeah, and whilst it ages me to say so, (laughs) I'll say this much and I've said it in um, a lot of the press that we've been doing, you know, you don't set out to make, like I don't anyway, a definitive album. I hope that in... In some ways, it's just trying to get better and better or continue to stay within a stream of um, creativity that you can learn from doing albums. The only way you get better at them is by simply doing them. And so um, a lot of people go, 30 albums, oh, my God. But but actually, if you think about it, any industry requires hours, hours of practice, including an orchestra itself. Uh, the symphony orchestra could put up charts and they were recorded within two or three passes, which is proof of their excellence. Mm. And for an artist to become any good at being a recording artist, and I don't even think yet I've got to that space um, where I'm comfortable in the studio and where I've written songs and, you know, could make a full, complete album of work. I'm just, I'm still going for it. I'm still going for it. And, and, and yeah, this is just yet one of those projects that I'm going for it. Well, I was about to say that uh, 30 albums is a bit of a piss-poor effort because Nana Muscuri has done 450 albums. That's right. You're a long way behind Nana. One of my favourite artists. Oh, my God, I love Nana Muscuri. She's just (laughs) like, you know, there's there's a voice and a type of singer that doesn't exist for the new generation of singers. Um, and I can name a whole list of them that I adore and who I was raised on a diet of, one of whom was Nana Muscuri, um, Dusty Springfield, Petula Clark, um, Dionne Warwick, Scylla Black. Um, these were singers. These were the giants. These were the big singers. I mean, we have Lady Gaga, who I think is sort of all of those in, in embodied in one singer. And I like to hope that there's that Roberta Dionne Warwick in me and the Dusty Springfields that brings forth that, you know, it's it's jazz laced with kind of rhythm and blues, it's laced with country rock. I mean, we are essentially Renaissance singers. Well, let's uh, drill down into the songs that you've chosen to do on here, 10 tracks uh, from uh, various parts of the career and various uh, genres that you've done over the career. I guess starting with one of your best-known songs, uh, Brave. And the minute I heard this with a symphony orchestra, it just took on a whole new dimension. Yeah. Have you ever gotten into that Peter Gabriel record, um, Scratch My Back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I I was deep diving into that. There were two albums. That that was like a real, um, a real, a real strong concept for me about that. Um, the way that he was in there and, and reiterating certain story storylines that he's been singing for all of his life and then he turned them into those orchestral things. But then the other track that was second that was Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now from mm. Love Actually, the film, mm. and something broke me when I heard that track. I heard, you know, you've got what, what was five decades for Joni when she recorded the newest version of Both Sides Now, and she's recorded that song, a song that's meant so much for her personally and has trained, it, it's transformed and it's and it's become is sort of bittersweet, you know, as she's gotten older and and in some ways it's become more important. Well, I think all of that applies to Brave. Mm. Uh, I wrote that song as a, you know, as a young 18-year-old with my brother in a desperate effort to kind of win back some, uh, I guess, 
credibility from the A&R guy, a very famous A&R guy that we were working with who um, was really, oh, he was so upset. He's walking up and down the console in the studio. We're in the studio. It's 2,000 pounds a day. I think I'm still paying <laughs> the royalties that I've, you know, unrecouped for this album. And he's going, oh, this is not the way we make hit records, my friends. We don't make hit records. And, and I was traumatised because I'm thinking, oh, my God, I, I don't, oh, hang on a second, uh, I don't understand. Um, first of all, I don't understand how to make a hit record. How could I possibly know? I've never had one. Mm. Um, you know, I, or I had with I'm Talking a hit album in Australia, but this yeah. is in London. And then, and then, um, and then I don't know what I'm doing wrong. You know, the only way you can instruct children, and I was a child, is by finding what they do right, and and exploring that and making more of that. But at the time, I was just like, "You loser!" <laughs> so I sort of i i went into the next room where there was a beautiful grand piano, and my brother, my my excellent brother Phil Sobrano, who is just possibly the loveliest um, champion anyone would want. He he sat there with me with the guitar and the two of us constructed what would become the mantra of my entire career. Mm. Yeah. It's really sweet. It's yeah, and and to open the album with that, you you go to uh, it, it's not just a hit album. In fact, it's not even a hit records album. Uh, you get quite obscure in here too. Uh, Earth and Sky, uh, that was from the Dallas and Kate album, wasn't it? I didn't, I didn't go for all the obvious things, no. What I wanted to do mostly was to find out where I was resonating as a being now, as a person, as a grown-up, and knew that I could tell an audience that here's a story you might not know about me, blah, 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 and I could sing it within the song and it would speak for itself. So rather than me having to roll out the hits, da, 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 which, of which there'll be plenty within the concert itself, like... Mm -hmm. We'll go in and I'll go through Superstar and various other things. But I felt that um, poetically there was a lot about Earth and Sky that I was resonating with right now. And uh, I think a lot of artists would agree. It's very hard sometimes when you have differences, things that divide us, um, including our industry itself, this, this kind of this need to have to put us all into categories. When Madison Cunningham won the folk album, I thought that was the most perfect example of how ridiculous this can get. There's a few deep dives on this album, uh, Time to Think, uh, which uh, a track from the Pash album. Now, you wrote this with Chaz Jankel, who was, for me and Jury and the Blockheads, the man who wrote Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick and Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll has written a song with you, Kate. That's great. Yeah, Tempted by the Fruit of Another. I... <laughs> It's a, it's it's a double it's a double thing on that yeah, yeah the the provenance of the song means a lot to me I was in London and working with people like Chaz Jankel even I remember recording um Kensal Road and All of Madness when they're doing their album and I am I'm very much a, a British pop aficionado I mean not aficionado I don't I don't claim to know everything about there is but eighties British pop had a massive impact on me. It was like you said, XTC, Ian Dury and the Blockheads, UK Squeeze. These were bands that were were affecting us. Crowded House were very affected by them. Um, a lot of Melbourne bands from Hunters and Collectors, you name it, that they, they were being affected by these British bands. They were British bands that were um, public schoolboys, tongue in cheek, often hitting the establishment from each side, but doing it all with a big smile on their face. Mm. And when I wrote this song, Time to Think, it was it was as stark and bleak as a 60s British movie about an unwanted pregnancy. Mm. Like quite literally when I hear the song, I go straight back to one of my favourite movies called Up the Junction and Class Wars, a person trying to make do, they're living this middle-class life, something awful has happened, a betrayal, and they have to just keep a stiff upper lip and get on with it. And I love that song. I love that song because it's got all of those meanings for me. Mm. 
Well, there's uh, actually uh, three songs, I think, from the Pash album on here. Uh, you also do Sympathy, which is uh, also a bit of a deep dive, uh, but also the uh, the big hit off here, Pash. Yeah. I think Pash, for me, was an album that I felt um, it was a coming of age of sorts. You know, in recent times I've had the middle age crisis, you know, where you've kind of, I, I actually I made a beautiful middle age crisis in my opinion, with The Dangerous Age with Steve Kilby. I mean, to me, that was a love letter um, of of the highest order to someone who I still think is one of the sexiest humans in rock and roll, up there with Nick Cave, Steve mm-hmm. Kilby. He forever will be the sound, that syrupy, fabulous, dreamy, psychedelic sound of Australian rock mm-hmm. and pub rock. And that album, which I composed the music for, that was my midlife crisis. This was me driving a car much cooler than the one I own. Mm. Let's put it that way. I, I think it's a very, very undiscovered jewel, that album. Mm. But we're not talking but but not talking about that album. Let's go cut to that 20 years ago. Pash was the same, delivered the same feeling for me. I came back to Australia after being in America and I I'd done a lot in America to sort of try to work out what did I want to do for the next 30 years of my life? I knew I, I wasn't going to be a good enough actress. I sort of had studied acting, wasn't very really great. I'd studied flamenco dancing, wasn't going to be another out-of-work flamenco dancer. It seemed that the thing I was going to do was come home and and, and just get back in the skin of Kate Sobrano and, and drive her, you know. And when I brought back Pash, what I loved most about it, people wouldn't or couldn't believe that it was me. Mm. And so, in essence, it was like killing off Kate, who was, and starting to be another kind of Kate that I was more willing to become. The uh, the Kensal Road uh, album also gets uh, two tracks off here. We uh, end the album with Champion. There's also Louis' song on here. Uh, is yeah. that an important album to you? Well, those those choices of tracks from the album make it an important album for me because it was sort of I was kind of fighting for my own identity within that album. Much as I loved recording the album, you know, I was working with a very, very famous um, A&R, as you would know. Um, well, I won't mention names because only because he, he, he's he's one of Australia's most famous. <laughs> That's, well, Ross Fraser, I will say, because yeah. he, he's someone I respect greatly. Mm. I I respect him immensely. Obviously, for those who are listening who don't know, he was, you know, the driving force within Glenn Wheatley's and John Farnham's um, The Voice. When I was working with Ross on the album, Kensal Road, which is a really beautiful album, I felt that there was something, and I don't know whether it was Ross, it wasn't intentional. It could have been the times, but a lot of singers were singing very lightly in that period of time, you know, like a lot of folk singers even were even doing covers in that kind of really sweet sort of tiny voice. Mm. And as you know, I have a big voice. And so I desperately wanted to be a success on that album for Sony. They'd gone out on a limb for me and I wanted to do everything they wanted me to do to make it a success. And and which was, you know, they, they picked a beautiful song, Magnet, but it wasn't my song and, and I was struggling with that. Mm. I was struggling to sing smaller and I was struggling to sing other people's songs. Mm. And the two songs that I've selected off that that record are big songs with big stories behind them that I felt were slightly diminutized by the recording, but it wasn't because of anyone's fault. The album is beautiful. I, I love the album. There's some moments on the album that are very, very dear for me, but the two albums I selected off them are deeper. Mm. There's also they needed to be on a different album. Mm. Yeah. There's also uh, two songs uh, that you did do with the West Australian Symphony Orchestra, Sunburn and Cherry Blossom Lipstick. Um, so why yeah. why have you gone back in with another orchestra, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, and, and done them again? Um, I think they're, they're like they're sort of sonic palette cleansers and they, they provided a sort of history for me as the jazz singer, you know, early Sergio Mendez, Carlos Jobim, mm-hmm. um, working with Mark Goldenberg, who I really love. Mark is a very a very gifted and a very traditional player. And, and you know, I was when I was recording Sunburn with him, 
I, it's a tip to people and the sound of um, people that have influenced me. And Cherry Blossom Lipstick was rather like, um, it's a part of me I don't think people um, think about much because I don't talk about it often. But when you're travelling and you're touring as often as I have, it's lonely. And I saw that movie, Sofia Coppola's movie, Lost in Translation, mm. and I really... I resonated with the lead actress and her character that, and, and I wrote a song about that and Cherry Blossom Lipstick was my my song for her. She was walking, it's, you know, it's got the sound of being alone, not, not lonely particularly, but being alone in a big city that's bigger and, and vast and, and, and busy and there's just you. Mm. And so... So you know, it is in in essence, it's the two of my two indulgences in the rec on the record that are really private. That's just, I don't know, it's just something like something that I particularly love about those songs. What about the song "Courage"? I wasn't able to pinpoint where that one had come from. My mum, uh, one of the most, you know, I I. I, I I think she needs to be known more of. I didn't celebrate her enough within her time as my manager. Um, she was responsible for getting Brave to go four times platinum mm. and she found the title tracks, Bedroom Eyes, and, and she found Nick Launay and she really took what was a, 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 just a feeling and took this young kid's inspiration and put it into that solo space. So for that I'm so grateful. So we cut to years later when she um, and I were working, still working together, I guess, more or less, but she, she'd she now left. It was after Superstar. So we were working right up and through until Superstar and then and then um, I went into different management and moved to New York. Uh, and she met and married Ben Balfour, my stepdad. Mm -hmm. And this powerful woman had written her vows and part of her vow was... Uh, I can't believe I've met a man who has the courage to love me. And I thought, wow, there you go. As a singer-songwriter, you couldn't wish for a better gift than that. <laughs> so I put together a song for them. I wrote it very fast, and that was their wedding gift. All the shows are coming up with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, one at Hamer Hall and also uh, one over at the Melbourne Town Hall later in the year and uh, at various stages around the country. We have, yeah, what is probably a national tour that will be symphonic mostly. Mm -hmm. And for for this age and for my aspirations as an artist, I feel like that is like the highest apex you could wish for, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, and when Melbourne, when when the symphony orchestra sold Hamer Hall and it sold out like that and we put on a second show, I was just like, this feels like, this is what this is what I would have wished for myself as a present for forty years in the business, mm. especially and also the town hall. I love whilst I love Hamer Hall and its glamour and and formality, um, I love the general public kind of atmosphere at the town hall or the acoustics and noisy and brash. So we'll have like two different versions, and I think those two versions represent me really well. Like I might be all grown up and I might be someone's mother but I'm still a punk at heart. <laughs> well, you let me know if you need an extra triangle player. I'll come on down and ding for you. <laughs> Darling, you ding for me all the time. Have you always been, I think, as a champion to Australian music, there is no one like you, Paul. And I swear we are the last of the Mohicans. You, within your support and your, um, well, just your representation, of Australia and 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 of the the workers in song, my hand on my heart. Well, thank I've you. Been playing your music since uh, I was a lot younger, and so were you. Yeah, <laughs> those I'm talking vinyl <laughs> records on two WL Wollongong in the eighties. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Well, I'm talking. Um, I've only just grown up enough to understand how complex and magnificent they were and are mm. and uh Robert Goodge and and certainly Ian's vision for a perfect a perfect music in a sea of like Australian rock was very very punk and I love them for that I love them for my legacy that I was a part of that band yeah 
Well, I know you're a very busy person, but please do a few more I'm Talking shows over the years. Oh, I really okay. enjoyed last time I, I saw you. Oh, it was amazing. Opening for Brian Ferry too. like Brian, The wow. Brian Ferry one, the Memo Music Hall one. Yes. Oh, I'd love that. That would be <laughs> sick. Yeah. Well, Kate, great to see you. You too, darling. Do well. I'll, I will see you for the next one. It could be a new, a new I'm talking album. Who knows? Ooh, is that is that a hint? If they'll have me back, if they'll, <laughs> if if we're all, I know Zan just released a great new single. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you, you never know. Never stop dancing. Never stop <laughs> dreaming. All right. Well, see you at the Hamer Hall. See you show. later, Paul. Okay. Yeah. See you then. Later.